how can we even imagine a justice where the very conditions that support our lives, that give us well-being and health, that even give us opportunities for livelihood and work, that we don't define that in the social justice movement. I was very fortunate that my literally grooming and training um, into the ecology movement took place through social justice, through the women of the Himalayas. Can anybody hear her? Okay. okay. Yeah. But also because, but also because, because the forest produced the sustenance, whether it was through water or fuel or water that the forest provided through the springs. And women saw it all in total interconnected whole, that the rights of the forest and their rights as producers were the same set of rights in one interconnected web. Because we live on a common earth, she sustains us. We are part of the web of life. We are not outside that web of life. We are members of one community. At the base of it, we are all members of the earth community, yes. which is both our ecological identity as well as the basis of our common humanity. And then yes. you have all the diversities. But the foundation is our common ecological life and our common humanity. That's where we have to redefine all movements for equality and justice. And I'm just so happy. I mean, two days ago, I was in Ladakh where the women are organizing. Yesterday, I was with a network of 1,000 women, but they represent 4 million women trying to create local economies in the face of the brutal destruction of corporate globalization. And that's what gives me hope, the creation of living economies where nature and people work in partnership to not just create justice in a stagnant form, in a very pathetic way, the metaphor of dividing the cake, but because we are living on a living earth, we, the cake is not a static cake. The cake is the potential of life to constantly create abundance, more and more and more. <clears throat> And so I, I love the energy, I love the passion, and um, I, I have another question for you. There was something very interesting that um, I found in the book, and that is uh, connections. I mean, you're making all kinds of connections throughout the book, but you really connect the dots between the market economy, economic insecurity, and the rise of religious fundamentalism. And not only do you connect them, but you actually have a causal relationship that there's cause and effect, that the market economy and the religious fundamentalism are a cause and effect relationship. Now, having said all of that, as you know, the 9-11 that happened here on September 11th, that horrible day, during that time, there's a lot of debate. Some people were saying, you know, that... We had, as Americans, the way we live had something to do with that. And then most people would say, oh, no, 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 no. We had nothing to do with that. That is just fanaticism and, that, you know, crazy people on the world. And they are just, um, they're mad about our freedom. Now, I'm wondering how you would respond to that, given what you're saying with the connection between the market economy, the economic instability, and the uh, religious fanaticism. Okay. Um, yeah. These connections for me became evident when I was trying to understand our 9-11, which is actually 13 times more than 9-11, the tragedy of Punjab in 1984, where the lands where the Green Revolution, which is the name given to chemical farming when introduced in the third world, was introduced. And later, the Green Revolution was given a Nobel Peace Prize on the argument that the chemicals and the new seed bred for the chemicals would create a prosperity in the market economy. And this would be a model alternative to the Red Revolution taking place in China. Therefore, it was called the Green Revolution. And it was supposed to create peace and prosperity. But by 1984, Punjab was a land of war and extremism of every kind. And the army was sent into the sacred shrine of the Sikhs, the Golden Temple, 
And then Indira Gandhi, our prime minister of that time, was assassinated by her Sikh security guards, and the spiral of violence went on and on. And what I realized at that point was that because the market economy works in what I call a reductionist framework, a, a mechanistic framework, it assumes mm -hmm. static things, people to whom you do things, not people as active agents who can get angry, who can get frustrated, who can be satisfied, who can be peaceful. All those potentials are there. Now, it was defined as prosperity if you can sell more chemicals. For the farmers, it meant more debt. A centralized system of agriculture meant farmers of Punjab felt they were being enslaved. But farmers were experiencing this as subjects. The Green Revolution designers, which included the corporations, the U.S. government, the World Bank, were seeing it as objects they were playing around with where they could manipulate the figures to say everything's wonderful, but it exploded. What we are seeing around the world, whether it's 9-11 or what we are seeing in Iraq and Syria or Nigeria with the kidnapping of the girls, Boko Haram, is all part of one common phenomena where a corporate globalization, very narrow-minded, only looking at the interests of how corporations can grab resources on the one hand and markets on the other hand, leaving people disposable, creates very, very alienated and frustrated societies. And each of that step of displacement leads to new levels of violence. Sometimes that violence reflects back on where those who are frustrated see the root of the problem. And I think 9-11 is an example of that. But in the case of Nigeria, the kidnapping of those girls is an example of not knowing where your unviability, your sudden inability to live in your ecosystem, your economy, your country, where does that come from? And in the lack of that grappling with the whole, they then start targeting whoever is more vulnerable as their sense of get, gaining control. And you get this on and on. Now, of course, to understand this, you can't have the linear causality of a mechanistic paradigm. You need a contextual causality. You need a systems causality. That's why I'm so grateful I did my PhD in the foundations of quantum theory. Um, mm -hmm. Because quantum theory teaches us there's nothing like a static thing in the universe. Everything is a potential. And the way okay. we create economies, we can either kill the planet and kill people's viability and create these cultures of fear, insecurity, hate, violence, or we have the potential to create living economies and through that create peace and the ability of people to live in the shared commons that the earth has given us with all their diversity. Nigeria ha has had Muslims and Christians before, but there were no killings of the kind we see today. Every society, we, the Sunnis and the Shias were living together. Suddenly in Syria it's become a problem. It wasn't a problem. And I think it's very important to understand that where there was coexistence, why is there now a problem? And, and maybe we should take a lesson from the Ebola virus. After all, it moves from animals who've been displaced from a forest to human communities. Wow. We rob their space, and then it affects us. So everything is interconnected. And the real problem for me with corporate globalization is it is based on blindness in assessing the consequences. Because all that matters is the returns you have in that quarter. And it doesn't matter how those returns come. And it doesn't matter what the consequences are. And I do think every CEO, every, every corporation, should now get lessons on ecological, contextual, systemic causality. And this is your responsibility. You triggered this impact. And I think corporate globalization and the greed and monopoly and narrow-mindedness to it needs to be reconnected now to the huge human instability we are facing on the planet, which I call cultures of killing. And what could be more dramatic than the fact that ISIS used to be the name 
of the Egyptian goddess. Yeah. And today Isis stands for something totally different. And this is a genetic mut mutation taking place in human society because of our inability to understand connections. Wow. Whew. So you, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You so hit the, the, the hammer on the head of the nail in everything that you're saying. I'm, you know, you talked about how the what the um, the fact that people are not feeling who they are anymore, that they're disposable. And so, therefore, their identity, this identity crisis is now clutching on to this negative identity. And, and, the, and, the, and these are the consequences that we're seeing. Um, it's a really thing. And what you just said about the Ebola and the, and the that, was, that was, I have to sit with that one for a minute. That was, that was really a very potent statement you just made. You also argue that um, that we should base our economic systems on nature's living systems. You talk about self-organizing, it's decentralized, it's decentralized decision making, interconnected, local, emergent, small scale that then emerges to larger scale networks. How do we do it? How do we turn this wheel around? How, how do we get there? Well, I think, of course, the first is we, uh, we need to make a break with that mechanistic idea which goes hand in hand with ideas of control. Because there never is control. You can't control Pachamama. But you have the illusion that yeah. when you dam up a river, you're controlling. And then she bursts and creates a flood. When you mine a mountain, you think you're controlling her. And then you have a landslide and a disaster. Um, you think you can genetically manipulate um, living organisms by moving a gene or introducing a toxic gene, but we see all the uncontrollable impacts of super pests and super weeds in the United States because evolution and intelligence are the law of nature. Because not only is Pachamama alive and intelligent, every mm -hmm. being which is part of Pachamama is alive and intelligent, but the dominant thinking is that nature is dead. These are just objects that you can manipulate to will. So how do we shift? We start shifting in our minds and in our hearts. We allow that to guide us in small steps to create the living cultures mm. and move out of negative identity. Because the minute you have a positive activity, that's why we talk about gardens of hope in Navdanya, that to heal the planet and to heal humanity, just take a bit of soil, a seed. Even if you don't have land, take a pot, put it in your balcony, nurture it. That nurturing becomes the paradigm shift and the world you shift away from the identity of fear and loneliness to the identity of interconnectedness and hope. That shift is in the hands to make. And we need to make it, because if we don't, we can see two things happening. One, of course, the planetary destruction, the entire ecological crisis, and it's not into the future. I mentioned I've just come back from Lada. Glaciers that were there last year aren't there this year. They're villages without water. They'll have to move away. And how many people of the 7 billion can you displace through these mechanisms? But the second is what we were talking about, the impact of this economic model on an identity of fear and negativity that more than I am this, I'm part of the earth, I'm an earth citizen, I can cultivate the soil, my hands are creative, I don't have to be unemployed. All of that is a positive identity. The negative identity is I am not this. It's a negation of something else. And yes. then you're constantly pitted at war with each other. You're constantly in conflict. And that conflict then is a vicious cycle of violence that can't end. And between the ecological annihilation that we are collectively facing and this multiplication of violence that we are seeing in society after such, it's two kinds of breakdown. 
and collapse. One is ecological unraveling of the fabric of life, and the other is the social unraveling of the fabric of society. To heal both of those and put them back into a virtuous cycle of mutual care and mutual respect, each of us must become active. None of us is too insignificant. The, the challenge is this. The problems are huge. The solutions come from the tiniest of places. I was going to ask you that. Uh, the very, at the end of the book, it is so hopeful. You talk about how um, that the, the prevailing wisdom is large-scale problems need large-scale solutions, and you just completely defy that. And you, you brought it down to the simplest life that it's really about small people who we, we are all big people doing what we do and that that's where change really takes place. It was so inspiring. So I'd just like you to like, let our, the, the people who are on this call know what is it, what are, the, what are the things that we can do? How is it that actually small steps make the big difference? Well, the reason small steps are big is because everyone can engage in them. And rather than have five operations destroying the planet, you can have the possibility of seven billion human beings working with our other species to heal the planet and, um, and create a life of well-being for all, including human life. And that's the other issue, that old paradigm pitted humans against nature, that every time we destroyed nature, there was the assumption that somehow humans will be doing better. So we kill the bees and we kill the butterflies and we spray the pesticides, but we also get the cancer. So it is not the case that destroying nature is a victory for humanity. Every human being is part of that web of life. And the small steps we can take, I talked about grow your own food, take care of your little seed. I've just read that the USDA is making it illegal for people to have seed libraries. I think everyone should follow Gandhi and have a, a heritage seed protected in their home and announce that this is my higher duty, this is what we do in Navanya, that we have a higher duty to the earth, and therefore these laws that are made so that five corporations can control the seed are too low and too degraded for us to be afraid of and to obey. But I think the second is really just take care of each other. You know, we are living in times of such tension. Um, we're living in an economy which has written off future generations. They're basically saying we don't have to care about the people. We don't have to care about whether the young people borrowing money to go to college can get a job when they come out. Uh, and to me, that is cruel. You know, we've had the Native Americans and the Indian civilization have, have, have had this measure of the seventh generation. That anything you do, measure it against the seventh generation to come. It's going to harm them, don't do it. It's going to benefit them, then do. So I think. Our biggest leap in small steps is to get together and say the economy is not what the global corporations design because economy comes from the same roots as ecology, our home. This home is our shared commons with a shared potential to do things together. And I think each of us, wherever we are, should sit together and say, what is it that we can do to both protect the earth as well as create new work and redefine work. Work is not labor sold to someone else for exploitation. Work is the creative cultivation of both identity as well as production. I just love the way your, your entire analysis is just absolutely is the fabric of life. And I'm, I feel it that way. It's, I read it that way. It makes complete sense. And you connect the dots for me in a way that, um, that was new, honestly. And I so appreciate it. And I know that I'm not the only person who wants to talk to you. There are people who have been waiting um, for this phone call, for this WebEx uh, platform. And um, they are, they've been waiting for a long time. And so... I'm going to announce now that it's, we're going to go to question and answers, to Q&A. 
and know that only the people who are connected to this call via their computers can ask questions. So um, you can actually type your questions into their, there's a little comment section. So you can type your question into the comments box. So why don't you do that? And um, while you do that, I'm going to ask one more question. I just um, love the idea of living economies, the living culture, and living democracy. And I just love the way you frame it. And then all of that being under Earth democracy. And I just want you to, if you can just go a little bit into the concept of Earth democracy, how all of those three living um, categories fit under Earth democracy. So we've been repeatedly told that democracy is sort of waking up once in four or five years and putting a paper into a ballot box. And, um, and somehow that will take care of things. And we recognize that it is not for two reasons. One, the distancing between citizens and those who govern them. So that representation is not working. There's too many gaps. But the second is the intimacy between corporations and the state, which has given rise to what I call the corporate state. So you vote, and it's supposed to be of the people, for the people, by the people, but before you know it, it's of the corporations, by the corporations, for the corporations, who now yes. define themselves yes. as persons and define the right to destroy the earth and people's lives as their right to free speech. We're watching, um, I'm, I'm following the debate on the labeling law for GMOs for Vermont, where Monsanto, and they call themselves the grocery manufacturers, but they're basically the junk food manufacturers the Coca-Cola and the Pepsi-Cola, they've all joined up and say, we're going to see, sue a democratically written law for labeling because it's taking away our free speech, which in effect is saying corporate free speech, if assumed to be there, is the right to destroy the health of people, the freedom of people, and the planet. So Earth democracy is basically remembering that we are all children of Pachamama. We are all Earth citizens. That's what connects us all. Earth democracy then is shaping a democracy through our daily lives in ways that on the one hand creates living economy so that every species is taken care of, but also every human being is taken care of. And just as you said, there's been this division between the ecological sustainability movement and the social justice movement. Look at the fact that we have a huge animal rights movement, but it's not connected to social justice, and it is not connected to the rights of the earth as a whole. It is connected to particular animals that we take care of, but we will not be able to take care of particular animals if we can't build the mindset and the heart that allows us to embrace life on earth in its wholesomeness and in interconnectedness. That is where the positive identities of living culture comes in. But most importantly, when you are that embedded in the context of a living earth, it also gives you the guidance to practice democracy with the right balance of responsibility and rights. And that's what really creates the Gandhi and the Martin Luther King. That's where that spirit that can't be extinguished is cultivated, and we need everyone to cultivate that spirit of a living democracy. And I have to, I have to add you in there, too, and the Vandana Shivas as well, okay? <laughs> you are right up there in that pantheon of, of, of leaders that we all love and respect. And um, I want to go now to the Q&A. We have somebody who has a comment. And Leah, are you going to read read the um, the comments? I, yep, I've got a question from Karen Walas Walasik, and her question is: Do you think the desire to control nature might have roots in patriarchy and men's insecurity, jealousy, or disconnection with female life giving? That's a good one. Yeah, it up. yeah I, I think if it was sort of that static, we would have had in all cultures across historical time. 
the violence against the earth and violence against women. Now, a lot of women archaeologists have done work and shown that in societies pre-6500, before our time, you don't find weapons, you don't find one building of a ruler, all the communities share, and these were women-centered, nature-centered societies. Then about 6,000 years ago, you, we get the rise of the use of arms and military force as a form of conquest, and shift takes place from women-centered societies to patriarchal societies. But patriarchal societies are also not static. They're changing. And as I've written in Earth's Democracy, we are now seeing the hybridization of patriarchy as it existed and capitalism as a patriarchal form. After all, the corporation that says, I'm a person, is functioning like a patriarch on a planetary level. This capitalist patriarchy is leading to new levels of violence against the Earth, uncontrollable in fact that's what they're demanding. There should be no limits, no regulation. We want to frack where we want to frack. We want to mine where we want to mine. No, nothing should come in the way. That new violence is what is creating the extinction threat to humanity as a whole. So I would not, you know, at every point, I'm very careful to not essentialize. Because everything is unfolding. And it is not the case that men think this way and women are this way, but we shape cultures. And they're cultures in which both women and men are caring and responsible. And they're cultures in which irresponsible men become the dominant form of society. And that's what we are seeing right now. And we have to move into a future where care for the earth, care for each other, respect for diversity becomes the norm rather than the aberration. Excellent. Thank you. Great, great question and, and an incredible answer. Leah, do you have uh, another question? Chairman, and that is, what is happening now in India with the farmers, and are you seeing living economies emerging there? Yes. Yeah. Um, basically, what we see with the farmers is a deliberate attempt to make agriculture unviable by rupturing the relationships of the farmers with the land and the earth, which they see as a mother, linking them to global market, both for supply of seeds and chemicals, as well as to sell whatever they grow as a commodity. And the case of the cotton farmers of India is the most dramatic. This is an area, and cotton is an Indian crop. Cotton is what Gandhi fight for India's freedom. And I took inspiration from the spinning wheel to create Navdani as a movement for seed saving. For us, seed is today's spinning wheel. Today, in that area of Gandhi's ashram, we have the highest cultivation of Bt cotton, the GMO cotton, and the highest rate of farmer suicide. Uh, the suicide levels since globalization 95 have hit nearly 300,000 this year from government statistics. Wow. The suicides are a result of debt. Debt is a result of wanting to exploit the farmer and not allowing them to have a fair return for what they've grown and not allowing them the freedom to have their own seed to be able to practice ecological agriculture wherever Navdanya is working. And we have replenished the seed as a commons and the ecological knowledge of farming with the earth rather than against her. Three things are happening. Biodiversity is coming back on our farm, which is a teaching farm where we have the Earth University. And I hope some of you will be at some point in the future able to visit for some of our courses. We have six times more pollinators than in the forests around. So we've created a habitat for more life, including the soil, including the pollinators. The farmers have a positive income. And in the cotton areas, we have a beautiful a campaign called Fibers of Freedom. Cotton has become the reason for farmers killing themselves. Um, we want to turn cotton back into a fiber of life and fiber of freedom. And so we distribute local seed through our commons, community seed bank of cotton. 
farmers have shifted to organic cotton and then it's processed through Gandhi's hand spun hand woven um, khabi um, with beautiful vegetable dyes. The Fibers Freedom Project. Farmers are getting three to five times more incomes. And in other cases, with local biodiversity, farmers are sometimes 10 times more. So the, chasing the market, in fact, is making farmers lose. Turning to the earth is actually increasing farmers' income. <laughs> well, it's interesting the, what you said about uh, cotton becoming a fiber of freedom and, and life. And it's certainly not the history of the African American in America, cotton. Because went off. Yeah, it has a whole other meaning for, uh, on cotton. Can we um, ask one more question, Leah? Do we have one more? A lot more, but we're going to go to one more, which is, um, this is part of a, a two-part question from Erica Harris, and ask the second part. How do you suggest we journey and transition from the um, mechanic, mechanic, mechanical model to a whole systems model? Well, I think, of course, the journey from a mechanistic worldview to an ecological worldview of living and being in a living world, um, the journey is a journey that simultaneously, a journey of the mind, a journey of the heart, and a journey of being, which is why doing things differently becomes very, very important, because it's out of that experience that the mind changes. Abstract change will not happen. There will not be a switch from a mystic paradigm to a new quantum ecological paradigm, just head to head. It comes through participating in processes of transformation. So the transition is both a transition in paradigm, but a transition of practice. And I come back again, and no practice is too small or too insignificant in making that transformation. Beautiful. Great question and a wonderful answer again. So we have run out of time. We are over because we started late, but we wanted to continue and, and really have this wonderful discussion. And so we are now at a place where we are going to have to close the conversation. And before we do that, so before we close, I want to let folks know that we have a survey that we are going to post right now. It's very simple. We really would love for you to fill it out. It helps us understand um, your needs and wants and, and how we're doing. So if you would please fill out that survey, that really would help us out a lot. So that's going to go up now. And while they're doing that, while folks are getting the survey and um, filling it out online, Vandana, I just want to really thank you. Um, this was amazing. And your, you and your work on the planet is exactly um, what we need. And you, you make us think and really look at all systems from a system theory point of view. And I really want to let you know just how much we appreciate you and the work that you're doing on this. Thank you, Kwanda. And today is Indian, in, India's Independence Day, and I'm rushing off now to celebrate freedom with young girls in a village school, which my grandfather had started and gave his life for. So how fabulous. I'm a little late, but now I'm rushing. That, well, what an auspicious day it is. We had no idea that we were having you on that day. So do what you have to do to have your celebration. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it, and we hope to um, maybe we'll have a chance to talk again in the future. Thank you, Kanda. Bye-bye. Bye now. <laughs> so all of those folks who are here in our listening audience, uh, thank you for hanging in and for being with us on this call. It uh, was so worth it, I'm sure. I, I know it was worth it for me. I hope it was worth it for you as well. So if you continue to fill out, as you continue to fill out the survey, I just have a few things to announce. First, I'm, I'm going to announce that if you can sign up for a symposium, which is the Awakening the Dreamer, Changing the Dream Symposium of the Pachamama Alliance, please sign up for a symposium if you have never done one before. It is absolutely transforming and is something wonderful for everyone to experience. 
You can watch it, uh, a DVD online, or you can go online to the Pachamama website, which is pachamama.org, and find out where a symposium is happening near you. Um, Also, we remind you to like us on Facebook, if you would. That's pachamama.org, and go to our Facebook and like us there. I also want to announce that next month, on September 18th, we are having another very special um, conversation with scholar, philosopher, and researcher, and human capacity researcher, Dr. Jean Houston. So I don't think you want to miss that. She is incredible if you know her work, and if you don't, um, I hope you will join us and you'll find out about Dr. Jean Houston's work. So we have her next month on September 18th, and we hope to see you there. And so we're going to close now. And um, we're going to have a new closing, and I hope that my technical team in the back is ready to um, unmute all of the lines, because what we're going to do is I'm going to count to three. And at the count of three, that we're going to open up all the lines and everybody just say goodbye together and say goodbye and farewell to each other. So we're going to try that, and here we go. So I want to, first of all, before I do that, I want to just thank you on behalf of the Pachamama Alliance for joining us, and we wish you, everyone, a wonderful future and a future for all the coming generations that we have a just and sustainable future. And so here we go to say goodbye to each other on the count of three. One, two, three. Goodbye, goodbye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.